students, welcome back to our course, Environmental Modeling and Simulation. Today we are going to continue our discussion on homogeneous reactors and we are going to explore how our typical reactors like batch reactor, CSTR or plug flow reactor behave when we have recycling within the reactor. Now, we frequently recycle some of the material that's coming out from the outlet in the CSTR or CMFR reactor back into the reactor itself, especially in case of wastewater treatment, because certain biomass or enzymes that are going out in the outlet are essential for the reaction in the reactor. So let's take an example of a CSTR or a CMFR reactor that has recycle in it and how that will impact the way we model. In a CSTR or CMFR, remember we have a tank and then we have an inlet from where the reactants are coming into the reactor continuously and then we have some form of outlet from where the react products are leaving the reactor. Now when we are recycling, we are introducing another pathway through which certain amount of what is coming out in the outlet is being recycled back into the reactor. Now since this is a CSTR, we assume that this is perfectly mixed reactor. Let's see how this will change, the recycle, how it will change the model. Uh, before we proceed, I do want to spend a moment here to talk about how what we are doing right now in the course differs dramatically from what we did earlier in the course. Earlier in the course, we were learning the basic mathematics that we need to develop empirical models. What we're doing now is using mass balance, which is conserving the mass of a fluid, of a reactant, of a contaminant or whatever we are interested in, in and outside of a reactor. And that alone can help us give us some very good information and insights into the processes, whether they're biological, chemical, definitely, most definitely related to environmental processes. Okay, so in this reactor, so let's say Q in is the rate at which the reactants or the fluid with the particular contaminant is moving into the reactor and the concentration of the contaminant or what we are targeting is Cn. There is some rate at which degradation or accumulation of the contaminant is happening within the reactor and then the things are leaving this reactor at Q out and C. C is the concentration of the given contaminant in the reactor. Now there is recycling happening. So let's say Q volume, QR, is the rate at which the recycled material from the reactor is being taken out of the reactor and then returned back to the reactor. And the concentration obviously will be C. It will be the same concentration in the outlet as in the reactor. And then the incoming recycling is again QRC. So now here if you look at, uh, we want to understand how the mass of a particular contaminant that we are tracing whose concentration is C inside the reactor is changing over time. So let's write the mass balance for it. Remember LHS of mass balance is dm by dt. Uh, very frequently we assume it is Vdc by dt which is true in certain cases and in the next example we will see the importance of starting with dm by dt. I want you to make a habit of always writing the LHS of mass balance with dm by dt and the volume outside the derivative if it is constant. Okay, so dm by dt is equal to remember the mass coming in. So the mass coming in is the flow rate coming in multiplied by the concentration. Remember in LHS and RHS in both places we want the unit to be mass per time because that's the unit we have on LHS. So we have Q in C in and then what is leaving the reactor which is Q out C and then what is coming in via the recycle which is plus Q R C and then what is leaving via recycle which is minus Q R C and we'll very quickly find out that these two terms cancel each other out and we are left with Q in C in minus Q out C. Now this is us doing mass balance on the mass of the contaminant that we are tracking or the substrate that we are tracking. If we do mass balance on the fluid itself, we will see that Q in is equal to Q out. 
because mass, uh, if we are increasing, if Q in is greater than Q out, the volume will keep expanding to keep the density constant. Same thing with Q in not being equal to Q out, but being less than that, we'll have issues with the volume changing, which is an assumption here that volume remains constant. So what we see is Q in is equal to Q out. So this simplifies into Q in C in minus Q in C. Now dm by dt, since volume is constant, can be written as V dc by dt. Now this is exactly similar to what you were seeing in CSTR, in CMFR. And then of course at steady state, LHS will become equal to zero, and then you can figure out what needs to be. Oh, I forgot a very important part of mass balance. There is reaction happening inside the tank and we need to account for it. So let's say there is degradation happening, R is the rate at which degradation is happening. It is first order reaction, let's say, so I'm putting C, it does not have to be first order reaction. So in order to be more accurate, let's put C N, it could be a zero first order, in that case we'll still have N equal to one, it could be zero order, in which case N will be equal to zero. It could be second order kinetics where N will be equal to two. We discussed this in one of the previous lectures recently. So always remember, to talk about degradation and accumulation happening within the reactor, very important part. Okay, so this is what happens when we have a CSTR that is undergoing recycle. So let me just write here, CSTR, and this is also true for CMFR kind of reactors, very similar. Now let's see what happens to a plug flow reactor with recycle. Now remember one thing, the defining feature of plug flow reactor is that the way the fluid moves through the reactor ensures that each plug of the fluid is not interacting with the neighboring plugs of the fluid. So basically there is no mass coming inside the plug of the fluid, no mass leaving the plug of the fluid. And that is one of the reasons why I like to think of PFR as a batch reactor in motion. Now, since it is a batch reactor in motion under ideal PFR conditions without recycle, the concentration of the contaminant or the compound that you or the organism substrate you are targeting, you are tracking will change with distance. So what becomes important is how dc by dx varies, how the concentration varies by distance and then depending upon the velocity of your plug flow reactor or in environmental processes, the velocity of the river you can easily understand what concentration to expect at a given distance at a given location. When the plug flow is undergoing recycle, things change a little bit. There is additional mass coming in, which is mass that we have recycled. There's additional mass leaving the plug. And what we need to do is we need to take one plug and figure out the mass balance for that plug and then use that to understand what's happening in the entire PFR. So let's draw a PFR. So let's say this is our plug flow reactor. And we have Q C out, C out is the concentration of the contaminant in your fluid that's leaving the plug flow reactor. And then we have Q C in, C in is the concentration of the contaminant that's entering the plug flow reactor. But now you're having a recycle happen. So recycle will look like this, a part of this is recycled here. So RQC out is the recycled flow rate, the flow rate of recycling and the concentration will be same as C out because we are taking it from the outlet of the plug flow reactor and recycling in. In order to understand what's happening in this plug flow reactor, let's follow one plug. Let's say the cross sectional area of this plug flow reactor is A. I'm going to take a narrow slice in this plug flow reactor of width dx and cross-sectional area equal to the cross-sectional area of the plug flow reactor and I'm going to do mass balance there. So this is the control volume I'm looking at. Its cross-sectional area is A, its width is dx, the fluid moving through it is moving with velocity v, dx by dt is equal to v. So let's do mass balance for this. On LHS, we will have dm by dt, which is the rate at which the mass of the contaminant is varying inside this narrow plug, which actually can be rewritten as dc into volume by dt. So now let's look at 
Cv, we are assuming that the concentration of contaminant inside this plug at any given time is C. However, the V is very interesting. The volume of this area of this narrow strip that we have taken can be written as dc a into dx by dt, right? See, this is the reason why in the previous example I said always start with dm by dt because depending upon the kind of reactor you have, uh, dm by dt will not necessarily be equal to v dc by dt. Okay, now let us look at the input coming inside this particular narrow strip and then leaving the narrow strip. So, let us say the flow rate will remain the same, q coming in, q going out. So, q is the flow rate at which the fluid is coming in. Let us say the concentration here is C. Now, since we are also recycling some of it, so R, Q, C is also coming in, the additional flow rate is coming in. And now, please notice one thing, I am not looking at the plug of the fluid, I am looking at a narrow strip in the plug flow reactor because the plugs of the fluid, they will not have any QC between them. But what I am looking at is like let us take a narrow strip in the reactor and see what volume of the fluid into the concentration of contaminant is coming in and what is leaving out. And then something will be leaving out and what is moving out from this narrow strip in the plug flow reactor, we will figure it out very soon. So, uh, let us say this location is x, then this location is x plus dx. If you remember what we did when we derived our Gaussian plume model, we are going to expand and we are going to figure out what c is at x plus dx in a bit. So, uh, this is basically equal to q plus r q c coming in minus q plus r q concentration this is concentration at x location this is concentration at x plus dx location and then plus minus some kind of rate reaction happening here. So, we can call it r into c c is the concentration of the contaminant that is coming in. Now, let us look here. How do we find out Cx plus Dx? This is going to be easy. Cx plus Dx, we can expand this and we have used these theorems earlier in the course so you know what to expect here. This will be equal to C plus Dc by Dx into Dx. So, what we can do is we can substitute the and some higher order terms. As long as dc by dx is not equal to 0, we can ignore the higher order terms and this is not going to be 0 because what I mentioned earlier, dc by dx is non-zero in plug flow reactor that is how we define the plug flow reactor concentration is changing with distance because reaction is happening. So, now what we can do is we can substitute this here, what our uh, mass balance on RHS is reduced to is looks like this. And then we can see that this term and this term here Cx they will cancel each other and what we will be left with is minus QRQ Now, let us look at the RC part right so rate of the reactant into the concentration of the contaminant. This RC will have the volume term, volume of the narrow strip of the plug flow reactor that we have taken. So, this RC can be rewritten as Ka dxc. So, now we have minus q plus rq dc by dx into dx plus Kac dx. dx dx is common, dx is also on LHS. We can simplify it at steady state. LHS will become equal to 0. So, we will get 0 is equal to Kac minus Q plus RQ dc by dx. Let me notify clearly that this is at steady state. We have set the LHS equal to 0. Now, a simple question that you might ask is why are we looking only at steady state? Typically, environmental processes, environmental reactors, we are not so interested in what is happening in the first few days or first few moments when we are not at steady state, we are more interested in how our process is going to be in next 5 months, 5 years, 50 years. So, once the steady state is reached, that is what we are more interested in. Now, this is what happens at steady state. We can integrate this 
Let's look at the limit of integration. DC will be integrating from C in to C out and then DX will be integrating from 0 to L which is the length of the plug flow reactor and what we will get is this from C in to C out DC by C is equal to plus A K Q1 plus R, R is the ratio of recycle 0 to L DX. Now notice one thing I have assumed that the reaction rate is positive which means there is accumulation happening but this does not have to be the case. Your K can be negative if degradation is happening in that case you will have a minus sign here. Even if you assume plus eventually when you do find out this value of K using this model it will come out to be negative if there is degradation happening or if you already know there is degradation happening then just start with the negative value and then you will get C out is equal to C in e to the power minus a k q 1 plus r q 1 plus r remember r is the recycle ratio l right you can simplify this but this is the answer we get now these are the easy mass balance situations where we typically have a very simple way to integrate and get our time dependent model as i discussed at the beginning of this course if i just give you this equation you can see there is some kind of degradation or accumulation in this case accumulation if the sign is plus if the sign is minus some kind of degradation happening of a contaminant with length with not with time but with length and it is also dependent on the recycle ratio it is also dependent on the uh, reaction constant it is also dependent on the initial concentration. So we already we can guess what kind of processes are happening but frequently once we had derived the integration the integration alone is not very intuitive. This is where these very simple um, uh, rate reactions can help us a lot if we apply geometric approach which we learned when we were learning how to write empirical equations. All right students, uh, so this is all I wanted to discuss about homogeneous reactors but now we want to step into heterogeneous reactors. Now heterogeneous reactors is something we will be focusing a lot in the next lecture but I would like to give you a very brief overview of what they look like and what are the typical examples that we use in environmental processes. So hetero A distinguishing feature of all homogeneous reactors was that the reactants and the products that were forming in the reactor were completely well mixed and they were all in the same phase. In heterogeneous reactors we might have objects that are of a different phase. For example, we might have a packed bed through which we are passing a liquid to get rid of a contaminant via adsorption. In that case now we have two phases, they are not perfectly well mixed with each other, they are separate but they are interacting with each other. This is an example of heterogeneous reactor. We can make a batch reactor a heterogeneous reactor, we can make a CSTR CMFR heterogeneous reactor, we can make a PFR a heterogeneous reactor. So heterogeneous reactors same principles apply that we used in homogeneous reactor but now we have multiple phases they are not a solution they are existing separately and they are interacting with each other. We are going to use the knowledge that we have about uh, transition of a contaminant from one phase to another, mass transfer from one phase to another. We are going to look at advection, dispersion, diffusion uh, through a single phase and also interphase and intraphase both when we look at heterogeneous reactor. Now let us look at some examples of heterogeneous reactor. A very simple common example is that of aeration tank in a wastewater treatment plant. In an aeration tank you have biomass that is floating around and inside your liquid which eventually settles down as sludge but in within the aeration tank it is suspended, it is not dissolved and it is very actively catalyzing your um, degradation of organics and removal of nutrients within the aeration tank. So this is an example of a heterogeneous reactor. The other example would be aeration itself happening in the aeration tank. So you have the tank and you have two phases, the solid phase, the liquid phase and now you have the third phase which is the gas phase. So as the bubbles are being pushed through the water in the aeration tank, there is a transfer of oxygen happening from the gas phase to the water phase. This is something else that we need to do mass balance for in this heterogeneous reactor. Another example would be a fluidized bed reactor. So in that case we will have a reactor we will have bed of some kind of product or some kind of polymer or in recently even gel or PVC gel. 
that will catalyze a particular reaction by desorption or by providing surface area for biofilms to grow. And now we are sending our contaminant water up against the gravity from the bottom, which will unsettle these polymers or these beads or this bed that we have put. And then the bed will, because of gravity, will try to settle down. So we have the velocity of the liquid going up, let's call it U liquid velocity of the liquid and then we have settling velocity of the bed which is us so these two will interact with each other obviously we don't want um, the ratio between un and us to be such that we lose the bed out in the outlet uh, depending upon the ratio between the velocity of the liquid that is moving up from bottom to the top and the settling velocity of the bed we might have a fluidized bed we might have an expanded bed or in case when US is zero, we just have a bed. Let's look at a typical heterogeneous reactor briefly. So let's call it slurry reactor. Slurry reactor is what we have in a typical wastewater treatment plant that uses ASP, activated sludge process. And it typically will look like this. We have an aeration tank where the substrate is coming in. The substrate here is your organic matter and the flow rate is Q, the concentration of the substrate coming in is QC in and this is perfectly well mixed and we have the volume of the reactor here V and the concentration is Cp and then this goes into the secondary settling tank, part of it is recycled, part of it is wasted, of course the solids are wasted. Now in this settling tank, let's say Qw is the waste flow rate and Cw is the concentration of the substrate in the waste that is solids that are wasted and Q minus Qw. Well, why Q minus Qw? Because notice we are conserving the mass of the fluid. If Q is coming in, Qw is being wasted obviously from the secondary settling tank, Q minus Qw is leaving out and the concentration is C out. So typically this is how a reactor will look like. And what we do is we define a control volume like so. So this becomes our control volume. And we do mass balance for substrate, for fluid, for whatever you want to track within this control volume. Okay, so how will the mass balance look like in this dm by dt? LHS is always dm by dt to begin with. Is equal to mass coming in, which is qc in minus mass leaving out which is qw cw minus q minus qw c out minus the reaction degradation or accumulation in case of accumulation it will be plus here we know we are talking about a slurry reactor in a wastewater treatment plant so the substrate is being degraded so in the slurry reactor in this particular case the r is the rate of the reaction a is the effective surface area provided by the slurry which provides the contact surface for the reaction to happen for the degradation to happen so um, and v is the volume of the tank as shared earlier so this is our mass balance system now let's look at r we have talked about r before in this course R is the rate at which the substrate is being taken up by microbes. We talked about mono reaction rate and we know that R is going to follow mono reaction rate. So R is going to be equal to R max into C divided by Ks plus C. Okay, right? Now, of course, depending upon the ratio of C and Ks, we might end up getting a linear system, which this is definitely not linear monokinetics. This is very important for all environmental scientists and engineers to know. Okay, now let's look at A. Remember A is the reactive area per unit volume of the reaction tank and you can write A as AP into CP by rho P. Now AP is the reactive surface area per unit volume of the flux of your biomass that are suspended in your aeration tank, Cp is the concentration of those flocks and rho p is the density of those flocks. So you can substitute all of these and then what we get is at steady state we will have 0 is equal to qc in which is coming inside the control volume minus qc 
leaving the control volume, just summarizing them together. Then we have the mono reaction rate constant R max multiplied by C divided by Ks plus C. And then we have A which can be written as so into volume. This is what happens at steady state. You can integrate this and it, it is slightly complicated, but I do want to write it down not for you to cram. Again, I have said this before in the course and I want to repeat it now. None of the final equations including the Gaussian plume model is something I expect you to cram. I know that these can be very tempting that hey I know the equation for what happens in slurry tank reactor. I don't need to understand how to do mass balance for it or how to use the principles and then I'll get good marks in the course. That's not what's happening here. You need to know how to write this mass balance equation. This is more important. I'm writing the equation to give you an idea of how it looks like and why just having the integral is not always sufficient for us to understand the process. It's not very intuitive. This is going to be a very complex integral. So I want to write just to demonstrate how the process is more important than the final integral. C, the concentration is going to equal to C in 1 plus R max by Ks into AP Cp V by Q to the power minus 1. Just by looking at it, this is not going to be very intuitive, but this is what it is. But this, however, helps me understand exactly what's happening. All right, students, this is all for today's lecture. In the next lecture, we are going to continue a discussion on heterogeneous reactors. See you there.